Hello, and welcome to Statistically Insignificant, which is totally not just a lecture about statistics, I promise. In my academic ivory tower suffering vertigo, my name is Tess, and I will be the statistical half of this semester. Banging on the door down below with quite a justified pitchfork, it's Bart. How's it going, Bart? Hey, how's it going? Um, I go by he and him, and since the last episode, I've been reading a lot of like entrepreneur and grind set posting, so what I've started doing is drop shipping artillery to the Russian army and the Azov battalion at the same time. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> I, I guess the question is, given you are drop shipping, are they of a similar quality to the stuff that's currently falling apart all over Ukraine? I, I think you've answered your own question with that one. <laughs> is it praxis to sell them crap that falls apart? Is Lockheed Mark Martin doing praxis by making the F-35, which just loves killing pilots? <laughs> These are the eternal questions. <laughs> It'll be a first for them. So our part of the world, mine primarily more than yours, has seen some really horrific floods in the past few weeks. I've not been directly affected, thankfully, but some of my students have. I figured it was a good time to talk about the statistics that are used to talk about flood risk. I'm also going to stick a couple of donation links for flood relief in the description below the video. To talk about this, we need to think about a river. So we've got a river down the bottom here. We'll say that the river level is usually about here. Although I am also going to put quotation marks around the idea of the normal river level because this will fluctuate day to day, right? You, you may have a particularly dry week or a particularly wet week. Whatever else happens, that's not going to be constant, but you're probably going to have relatively small fluctuations. Let's say... We're talking about building a house here. Look at my classic little house. It's going to have two windows, of course. There we go. Okay. If you have a large rain event, though, the river will rise as that rainwater drains into it. How high the river rises determines whether or not it floods, and how bad the flood is. But we also expect larger floods to be less common. So we can think about thresholds. This might be one level of flood where it comes up a bit on the banks. This might be the point at which it starts breaching the banks. And this might be the point which your house is in trouble. We expect the river to hit this level more commonly than that one. That is part of the bigger floods are less common assumption. And just because like ex more extreme events are less common. What we want from this, what we want from our statistics, is the ability to assess risk. For one, how likely is it that the house will be flooded? And how often? If we have a flooding event, we also want to be able to talk about how bad it is and how likely something that bad or worse is to occur again. We're going to look at a couple of closely related statistics. The decision to classify an area as a 1 in 100 year flood, which is the most common one. A 1 in 100 year flood risk, sorry. This is used for like planning and uh, decisions about whether or not this house should be built, or if there has been a flood, whether or not the houses should be rebuilt, which is currently a question that uh, a couple of towns in North New South Wales are puzzling over. In, in a, the case of a particular event, we want to look at the classification of a flood as a 1 in 100 year event. These sorts of terminology is also used for other disasters, like um, bushfire risk in Australia is a big one. But I imagine um, blizzards in places the world that freeze can be a bit of a risk. It can be dealt with like this as well. Um, I lived on a floodplain growing up, and yeah, apparently they don't let anyone build uh, houses as close as our house was growing up. So oh, fun! The risk assessment has changed. Yeah, well, hydrology, which is like the the study of water and water movement, is improving, but it's really hard. Uh, and yeah. a lot of, uh, historically, a lot of develop has, developers have been somewhat unscrupulous, let me say, where they put their houses and things. Uh, this is particularly a problem in places in the United States, which keep building poor uh, communities in floodplains and then having them flood. Shocking. I mean, growing it? up, it was always exciting when it flooded because you could go <laughs> canoeing through the forest. <laughs> Were you in a, um, a house on stilts or was it or the house got trashed every time? No, nah, the house never got trashed. It was f far enough up. It will only right. be if it's a, I guess, a one in 100 year flood risk uh, mm. where it will, uh, where that will be a problem. But it used to come up sort of just over the front yard fence. Ah, uh, okay. Fair enough. But the, yeah, there was a fair bit of land on it. Mm -hmm. 
For the statistic about a particular flood, we are interested in the highest level that the river gets to. So maybe over five different flooding events, we have peaks of 0.3 meters. And usually if you go like in places where you have this sort of thing, you'll suddenly, you'll sometimes have like, pardon me, a flood meter stuck into the side of the bank, which gives you the height of the river compared to some baseline. Uh, 0.2 meters, 1.2 meters, uh, 0.3, because these are uh, in sequence, and 4 meters. For the planning decisions, however, we look at an annual data set, which has the highest level reached in a calendar year. So if you have two floods in the one year, the highest of those would be considered. So if we imagine that um, these two floods occurred in the same year, for example, we would count this as the highest peak for that year. Yep. So the risk planning statistic is then built out of data around individual events over time. But the classification of an event is also built from the historical record of how high floods have been and is distinct to the actual measurement of the water height. What I mean by that is we look at thresholds. So if in 200 years, say, uh, where you've had 200 years of data, and we'll get to that, you've observed two flood events above four meters, and this is in 200 years. Then when you next observe a flood event, uh, above four meters, you can say, oh, we've seen this twice in the past 200 years, so we can estimate that this is a two in 200 or one in 100 year event. That threshold is important. You might see eight events on the same stretch of river that go above 50 centimeters in the 200 years, which would give you an eight in 200 year or one in 25 year event. So this up here was, sorry, was the 4 meter threshold. This is the 0.5 meter threshold. This would include what you see at the 4 meter level. As you drop that threshold, if we come back to our river here, if we think about like, yeah. uh, this is not to scale. If this is your 4 meter flood, and this is your 50 centimeter flood, anything going above this 50 centimeter level will necessarily like count. Yeah. Generally, you don't compute the threshold for every single centimetre. You'll have some classification, such as a threshold height for a 1 in 100 year event. 1 in 50 takes closest below. If your 1 in 100 year threshold is 1.2 metres, your 1 in 1,000 year threshold is 3 metres, and you see a 2 metre flood, you would call it a 1 in 100 year event because it hasn't surpassed the next threshold. Right. Would that have to be weighted for... Um... For example, with climate change. Oh, we'll get to that. More... Yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> yes. <laughs> when it comes to the flood risk assessment classification, the typical decision is that you can build on something which is a 1 in 100 year flood risk, but not more frequent than that. How that's decided is you look at your historical flood data for the area, take the highest peak each year, and then estimate whether you expect to see a water level which would endanger the house more than once per 100 years on average. There's a bit of depth here but we need to talk about probability theory to deal with it. The way that this gets modelled statistically is we look at a flood threshold, say this proposed house would be flooded if you hit the 2 or the 4 metre level. You treat this as a binary outcome over each year. You either do or do not see a flood of that level each year. And we denote this as 0, does not have a flood above 2 metres, let's say. And then 1 does have a flood. So this is annual, right? So you, you say each year it either does or does not. Yep. We then make some assumptions, and we'll look at these a little bit more critically uh, when we, in a little while. So the first assumption is that extreme rain events are independent year to year. This means that from one year to the next, there is no relationship in the occurrence or intensity of extreme weather events. Two, whether you see a flood of two metres or more has the same probabilistic behaviour. This is termed as having the same distribution, and it's basically about how we use an abstract mathematical construction to talk about the events. It's mostly a um, it's mostly a mathematical thing. Whether or not it's actually realistic is a big question. Three, we are interested in the largest rainfall event per year. And lastly, I'll squeeze it in the bottom here, the probability of an extreme rain event is the same year to year. This is slightly different too for technical reasons. Basically, you can have a probability that differs but still have the same like distribution behavior. 
Sorry, can you explain the difference a little bit more? So we have distributions which live in families is the is the general term for them. They have uh, related properties and are defined by the same parameters. Some of them, one we're going to talk about called the binomial distribution, has two parameters, one of which is the fixed probability of seeing something each time you look. So each year, same probability. Yeah. So you could have two binomial, two things that are binomially distributed, which is what we mean when we have like two things that look like that, and they have different fixed probabilities, but they right. are still both binomially distributed. Okay. So under these assumptions, we have a binomial distribution as the model. So you can think of this as modeling the number of flood events in a given number of years. There are two parameters for the binomial distribution, n, which is the number of years. It doesn't have to be years, it can be like tosses of a coin or people from a population if you're looking at like a categorical variable, but here we are looking at some fixed number of years with a fixed probability. And p, probability of flood above two meters. You can choose whatever threshold you like here. You just need to have the probability relevant to that threshold. Yeah. So we have assumed that for each year there is a fixed probability of seeing a two meter flood. This is p. And we look at how many of those we expect to see in 100 years, which is n. The expected number of um, floods in that period of time actually turns out to be n times p. If we have a 1 in 100 year flood area, that means we expect to see one flood in 100 years. So n times p is equal to 1, which is 100 times p, right? We can isolate the p by uh, dividing both sides by 100, so you get the probability is 1 in 100. If you see flooding more frequently than that, you might have two in 100 chance, which makes it like one in 50, and this looks like a one in 50 year flood risk. Less frequent would be like um, one event in 400 years, which gives you uh, one in 400, right? Yeah. Smaller p-value, less frequent floods. But just because you expect to see an average of one flood in 100 years for a one in 100 year flood area, that doesn't mean multiple floods are impossible or even unlikely. How we work with this is we use this binomial distribution, because once we have this probability, p, and we have the number of years n, uh, we can ask what the probability is of seeing more than one event in 100 years. How we write that is probability of, we can call it x, but we just write more than one flood, which is, uh, for mathematical reasons, equal to one minus probability of one or zero floods, right? Because if you think about it, your options for the possible number of floods, uh, flood peaks, annual flood peaks above two meters, right? Smallest number is zero. You see nothing for a hundred years above that threshold. Yep. If you see it every year, biggest number is 100, right? Because it's an annual statistic. Yep. So we've kind of divided up those options into um, more than one flood and less than or equal to one flood, yep. which gives us this, uh, this split here. This turns out to be, for um, the situation we described above, for a 1 in 100 year flood, 26.4 percent just over a quarter probability of seeing two or more floods in that time. This is one of the kind of issues with using this as a risk assessment. I'm sure I'll talk about more later. But people hear that and they don't think. They hear one in 100 years and they think, oh, it's not going to happen in my lifetime. It doesn't quite work like that, unfortunately. Yes. This model also tells us nothing about how close or far apart these floods might be. Under the binomial distribution assumptions, because we have assumed that the probability is fixed, year to year, and each year is independent. So if I had a flood this year, there's nothing preventing or ensuring that I'll have a flood next year. There is no difference to this model in seeing those floods exactly 50 years apart or 100 years apart or one year after another. There's a different distribution called the geometric distribution, which we can use to ask how many years until the next flood is, you know, how many, how many years do we expect to have until the next flood? if the probability 
is equal to 1 in 100, right? So this geometric distribution is used to model um, repeated events and you're asking how long do I have to keep doing this until I see one particular outcome. Yep. Like the binomial distribution, if you have a probability of 1 in 100, your expected time is 100 years, just as the expected number of floods in a 100-year period with that probability is 1. Interesting to note, though, there is a roughly 20% probability that the next flood will be within 20 years, according to the same distribution. These things, the likelihood of more than one event in a given time period, and the distance between events, is something that I don't think people get told about. They hear 1 in 100 years and think once in a lifetime, if that, but that's not how it works. This becomes a real problem when you have planning decisions, shall we say, which are not focused on the long-term viability of neighbourhoods and homes, but instead on maximising profits for developers. For example, because people can buy homes or buy into home building schemes in areas which are far more risky than they think. There's also shitloads of pressure on local planning bodies to approve developments in floodplains, and Got to be honest, most of the people who make those kind of decisions probably don't know a hell of a lot about these statistics. Your hydrologist, who's supposed to be uh, involved in that, should. But the like council people doing the approval, I mean, even the developers who are running a business probably don't have this sort of thinking behind them because they're not incentivized to, of course. This is obviously an ideological statement, but it also seems the closer you get to the ground, the more opportunities there are for corruption in a political sense. What, what do you mean? Like as in, in lo- at the local level as opposed at to... At the local level is much easier than through the federal government, for example. I think, the... Well, I think the scale of the corruption changes. Like at, at the local level, you're looking at individual businesses and planning developments and things trying to get approval, whereas at the like national or international level um you're looking at like conflicts of interest across borders far more yeah sure to get more into this i want to take a critical eye to the model particularly the assumptions of it the statistical field which analyzes stuff like this is known as extreme value theory looking at extreme as in far from typical events how often they happen that sort of thing I'm not going to go into great depth because, for one, I know barely anything about it, and for two, it gets very technical very fast, which is closely related to why I don't know much about it. (laughs) We can still talk about some stuff, though, so let's go back to these assumptions. We're going to look at three first because it's easy and a pretty reasonable construction. The only possible wrinkle is that the decision to divide up the time into calendar years is somewhat arbitrary. If you have a flooding event across New Year, it could cause issues with the data, but that's pretty unlikely. And to be honest, when you're talking about stuff annually, you have to make a cutoff somewhere. And wherever you make it is going to have that sort of effect. Yeah, so it seems like you would have the problem that if you have a three metre flood and a four metre flood within a single year, this that treats would not those count to your threshold. Yeah, yeah. So this would treat um, those as one event or one year where you saw those two events. Absolutely. Yeah. And like that can be a bit of a problem, particularly if you have a second flood while you're trying to rebuild like that, right? Yeah. Number one, so independence. Statistical independence is a difficult assumption to justify in many cases, and particularly difficult to justify for events over time, which we call longitudinal data. There are multi-year weather and climate patterns, which means that you have year-to-year relationships in weather. But these are difficult to measure and predict. So if you have a binary decision in front of you, do I approve this housing development? The approximation of assuming independence could work well enough. Likewise, if you're looking at a century, this year-to-year relationship might not be so important. We look at the um, stuff like climate change, though, in points two and four. So I'm going to highlight these in black. These are closely related. Because, as I mentioned, we have distributions, which describe the probabilistic behavior, and then parameters of those distributions, your P and your N, which describe the actual probability. Saying that you have the same probability each year is reasonable, or saying that you have a probability each year can be reasonable given you've got this 0-1 construction. And indeed, to assume that you have binomial behavior, also quite reasonable under independence, yeah. Uh, but as a as a model, it's not a bad one. But the constant probability, assumption four, this troubles me. 
climate change hangs over the dis- discussion of extreme weather events like, well, a bit of a rain cloud, really. <laughs> We have evidence that extreme weather events, extreme rainfall events, are becoming more common in some areas. Droughts are becoming more common in others, which you can also look at as an extreme event, but because droughts are a period, an extended time period, not just like a one week or three week thing, it is much harder to look at in this sort of framework. This means that we can expect the probability to be changing over time. Yeah. And that's not all. How water behaves on the ground, this is what the hydrology looks at, also changes with land use. This is one of the most fraught things when it comes to planning. Roads, paved areas, building roofs are not permeable to water in the way that undeveloped land is, and the human-built surfaces concentrate rainwater in drains, creeks, and rivers. Doubly true if you build a flood levee to prevent like, a, a river rising up into a new town, this can cause great flooding, greater flooding risk for the next town down the river because it um, forces all that water that would have spread across the um, across the up, upstream town to go downstream instead. So it seems more like um, it seems like using the calculations for what you get from a coin toss on like a deck of cards. Is that like an appropriate <laughs> analogy in this case? Uh, kind of, except the deck of cards keeps changing in front of you. <laughs> Eldritch horror, basically. Hell yeah. Your flood risk assessment based on the past, however many years before an area is developed, may not be a good predictor of what happens in the future. You can make adjustments, hydrologists do, to account for what will change with the new development, but there's a lot of uncertainty around that because it's really fucking hard. It doesn't account for the next development built on the other side of the river five years later. And because you're, you can't like test this, you can't easily build the town and say oh is is it flooding with the next event if it does well i guess we better go back and not build the town five years ago right you can't do that unfortunately having come having uh, grown up on the bank of the um, murray river there does seem to be a thing where because of erosion if you have like private land that backs onto the lake or river lake moela or the murray river often what people will do was is build concrete banks but that will then further the erosion down down the river, if you know what I mean. Yeah, and it's also, like, that may not be the best response in the local area either, because... No, absolutely. Yeah, that has... I feel like it's all very short-sighted to some extent, and it's forced to be short-sighted because, like, people don't have secure housing options otherwise. And, like, if somebody does wind up, as I suspect many people in Lismore will... With houses that cannot be occupied, but they don't get enough money to tear them down, they're screwed. I mean, even with the Christchurch earthquake and things in New Zealand, where they have much better disaster protection, disaster support than here, people wound up like horrendously out of pocket for the homes that were destroyed in that event. I would add with that, though, that just because of the value that that land, just because of the value of that land, it doesn't tend to be desperate people who do that stuff. It is Mm. kind of your local elites. Yeah. Just because uh, lake or riverside property is more expensive than property within the town, or yeah, but when your entire river. town gets flooded, then it's not just stuff on the river, you know? No, absolutely, yeah, yeah. So the the pe- the wealthy elites are more likely to have this happen, but when the really bad disasters do happen, there's just no protection for the people who aren't so wealthy. Yeah, there is another problem: the historical flooding data. In Australia, you'd be really hard-pressed to find 200 years of reliable flood-level data anywhere, given the British invasion was about 250 years ago. The land use in most areas has changed a lot in the past 50 years even. So if you're a hydrologist, you have to draw on a lot of other stuff to get estimates for a given area. It's not impossible to do, but every time you include an approximation based on other data, you have to add uncertainty, and that blows up really fast. If you're trying to estimate the 100-year flood risk from 40 years of data, you can still do it, but the question becomes a little bit different. You you don't necessarily estimate this stuff directly. You use a hypothesis testing procedure to ask, is there evidence that the risk is higher, right? And this is how you can use 40 years of data instead of uh, 100. So how we do this, we set n is equal to 40, and we keep p equal to 1 on 100, and then we ask... Given I have some record of events in 40 years, let's say I have observed two events, 
in the past 40 years, I can ask, if P is actually this 1 on 100, what is the probability of observing two or more events in the past 40 years? Because if it's more than two, then it's worse, right? So we look at two as the threshold. This is actually a hypothesis testing setup. A null hypothesis is that P is less than or equal to 1 on 100, right? Alternative, we're asking if there's evidence to support this, is P greater than 1 on 100, more likely to flood. We are asking, is there evidence to support that we are in this higher flood situation? What that looks like is we've observed two events in the past 40 years, we use our binomial distribution, and we look at the probability of observing two or more events, given these parameters for your binomial distribution. This turns out to be uh, 0.061, or about 6.1%. The question then is, is this enough evidence to think that our probability is actually higher? Is this enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis? This is the point where like extreme value theorem ste theory steps in. Extreme value theorem is something entirely different, by the way. We have relatively oh, little great. data. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> it's far more mathematical than extreme value theory. So this is a tough one because you're looking at fairly rare events and you have relatively little data. This is also the point where my ex the extent of my understanding runs out. Typically, if you are doing this like a hypothesis test in most other fields at least, you would say that 6.1% is not less than... So it's not less than 5%, because that's a um, typical threshold we use to reject our null hypothesis. So in this case, because it's not smaller than that, you would not reject the null hypothesis. But if it's my house that might be built there, I would want to have a much closer look at this. I would want to question the uncertainty on this number, because all statistics, even estimates like this, are only estimates. And that becomes a question for the hydrologist. Just because I feel like one of my jobs on this podcast is to upset STEM purists, I'd oh, also please. say I would also say that this would be a good uh, a good thing for a uh, multidisciplinary process of um, yeah, obviously hydrology, uh, but also combined with things like oral history, in terms of being able to get uh, a sketch of. Um, how many events have happened? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's really hard. And what's particularly difficult about that is that um, while oral history, well, it may or may not exist, and dates can be very difficult with it. Like you can, Absolutely. Yeah, so you can say, oh, my family has been living here for 200 years or something. We have records where my great-great-great-grandfather was writing about flooding behavior back here. If that exists, then that's great. That can become part of your um, evidence for how many events you've had. So that was coming to this two number. Yeah. But it becomes much harder to incorporate things like indigenous oral histories where they have lo much longer memory of yeah. events that have happened. But because... Uh, this kind of statistical analysis, it's hostile to things that don't have solid dates associated with them, I guess, because yeah. like incorporating data with uncertainty like that is very, very difficult. If it can be done, it absolutely should, but it's hard to do. Things like that always make me think about how amazingly stable um, society was here before wide oh, invasion. Yes. <laughs> like if, if the... you or any of our listeners have not read the book Dark Emu, I encourage you to go and do so. It is basically an account of the evidence around the um, civilization that was here before we uh, invaded and killed so many people and destroyed so many townships and fields and everything. And like based on the archaeological evidence, it had been that way and quite well settled and quite consistent for thousands of years, tens of thousands of years, possibly. You can also see this in the sociological aspects in terms of, um, yeah, how um, defined the land, land boundaries were. Yeah. So I, in, in this particular case, I'm going to present this as a theoretical example because, like, any time you go into actually looking at this and looking at the records, things get messier than this. 
Um, I am simply going to point at the problem and say that estimating the probability of these events is very hard. Data collection is very hard. And there is always a trade-off between the uncertainty of the statistics, whether or not the house you want to move into can be built or rebuilt, as is the case of Lismore at the moment. For our mailbag today, I have a truly cursed creation. Uh, this has been sent to me by a few people. Thank you to them, I suppose. Uh, <laughs> here it is. Now, would you believe that this was pre-produced by people doing NFTs? I'm the guy in the sicko's beam on this one. I love it. <laughs> it hurts. I already have a deep hatred of pie charts. I think that they can be difficult to read because comparing angles is harder than comparing heights in a column chart or something. And this one is even worse than usual. <laughs> because as you can see, they haven't even done a pie chart properly. In your traditional pie chart, each section should, theoretically, have an angle proportional to its percentage. So why the fuck does this 1% look like about 20%, about a quarter? <laughs> this 20% could easily be 50%, because that line goes all the way up there, right? The 55% looks more like 75%. They're not only disrupting finance, they're disrupting any sense of visual representation of data and my fucking sanity. <laughs> On the other hand, if you have the aesthetic sensibilities of an NFT guy, you want to include Pac-Man in there. <laughs> it's not even yellow. <laughs> now, at the very least, these percentages do add up to 100. It's just that the actual pie wedges are all screwed up. I'm also not entirely sure why they've put the extra precision of this 0.0% given all of them are 0.0%. My best guess is that it's to give the illusion of precision and objectivity because that is something NFT people simply love to do. None of these categories make any sense either. Uh, so <laughs> the, the specific context for this, and if you are feeling masochistic, I'll put the link in the show notes, dear listener is that these are proportions, sorry, percentages, of the total number of NFTs produced. So these are, for example, the ones that get allocated to the developers, which is 4%, four, uh, 4 I think? God, they even... I am guessing that airdrop points to the 1% based on where <laughs> that is, right? But this could be pointing to 1% as well. But also, burn when launched and developer aren't necessarily mutually exclusive. <laughs> I don't know. I have refused to learn <laughs> because I consider NFTs uh, a heresy, let's say. <laughs> that is us for today. If you, dear listener, would like more statistically insignificant content, or you just want to show that you really appreciate the work we do, bringing you such wonderful creations as this, sign up to our Patreon, patreon.com slash statistically insignificant. You can also find a link below. But thank you so much for putting up with me again. Thanks ever as ever for having me. I'm going to go get angry at some more graphs now. Bye-bye. <laughs>